So welcome everyone to today's session of the cardiac analysis seminar. So today uh, we have uh, Andrei Hrabustovsky from University of Radech Karlove. We'll talk about operator estimates for homogenization in perforated domains. So I hope I didn't mess up too much uh, the name of the university and indeed of the speaker. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation and uh, over to you. Thank you very much. And first of all, uh, I would like to thank for the invitation to talk uh, in the seminar in Cardiff. Uh, the, the work, the talk which uh, I will present today is based on uh, two papers, actually mostly on the first one. And uh, this is our recent paper which uh, with Mikael Plum from Karlsruhe, which was submitted. In summer, uh, but uh, the, the origins I would say come, came from this paper with Olaf Post from TIR. I will speak mostly about the first one with Mikael, but we'll make some comments on the, our paper with Olaf. And actually in some sense, the results which we get with Olaf could be regarded as a particular case formally, let's say formally regarded as a particular case of the second work, of the first work. Uh, here with Michael Plum. So let me start. Uh, let me start uh, from the introduction. I would like to actually to introduce you the class of problem or the problem we're interested in. This is uh, quite old, the problem with the quite old history. Uh, one of, I would say, one of the most influential problems in homogenization theory. And the problem uh, reads as follows. So I will simplify the life as much as possible. Uh, so we consider the domain omega. Actually, we do not suppose that omega is bounded or uh, unbounded, so it could unbound it as well. And then we perforate omega, which means that we make a lot of small holes. Uh, in this domain, there will be two parameters. Uh, the first uh, parameter is epsilon, which basically will stay for um, the distance between the neighboring holes. So as I say, we simplify the life cons by considering the periodic distribution of holes. Nevertheless, the results also can be obtained from more general distributions, but let's simplify the things. So epsilon is the period. And the other small parameter d epsilon will stay for the radio of these holes. And again, one simplification, we assume that the holes are just balls. So nevertheless, we, one can consider even more general holes, any shape, but as I say, let's do it simply. So it will be balls of the radius d epsilon periodically distributed in the space. I call these balls by large d i epsilon, so I will count them, these balls. And I need one more uh, notation. The square i epsilon will stay for the cube with the center, uh, having the same center as this, uh, uh, as this ball and uh, having the radius, uh, pardon, having the side lengths epsilon. So on the picture, pardon, on the picture, it looks like this. So this uh, squares, uh, you see them here, square i epsilon, and we remove only those balls which are not only completely be belongs to omega, but also the corresponding, uh, let's call it cell, period cell belongs to omega. Because such assumption is just simplify the life a little bit, some te technical things. Okay, so to summarize, we have a domain omega, we remove periodically distributed holes, Epsilon stands for the period, d epsilon stands for the radius. And one important assumption from the very beginning, we stick to the case when d epsilon is much smaller than epsilon. I mean, asymptotically smaller. So d epsilon o is or small of epsilon. Uh, the, the regime when they, have, they are of the same order is ra rather different from this one and we will not touch it uh, in this talk at all. Okay, now the problem we are consider is uh, the boundary value problem for Laplacian. Uh, so instead of the standard Poisson equation, I consider here an extra term plus u, 
this extra term plays no role at all. I mean, it doesn't make the life easier or more complicated. It just guarantees that this problem has always a unique solution for any right-hand side, because you see if omega is the whole space, uh, then this condition disappears. So, and if gamma is, for instance, zero, you have Neumann condition, then zero is in the spectrum of Laplacian. So to guarantee the solvability, you have to add an extra drum. So just to not to say all the time that the problem has a unique solution, I add this term, which guarantees that solution exists and unique for any right-hand side. So let's comment on the conditions on the external part of the boundary we have. Dirichlet, I mean, external is uh, this part of the boundary. And actually the choice of the conditions on the external part is not so important. I just took Dirichlet, but you can take Norman or any epsilon independent conditions. And what's important on the boundary of the holes, we took the Robin uh, conditions with the coupling uh, with constant gamma epsilon, which is supposed to be non-negative or even infinite. In case infinity, uh, this condition uh, is understood as follows. You have to divide by gamma epsilon on both sides and then you get the Dirichlet conditions, yeah? So in case of gamma is zero, you have Neumann. In case when gamma is uh, infinity, you have Dirichlet conditions. And when gamma is uh, strictly positive, you have like a, a pure Robin condition, so to say. So now the I didn't know by u epsilon the solution uh, to this boundary value problem. And now the question that we are interested in: Can we describe somehow uh, the behavior of this solution when epsilon goes to zero? So what's going on when epsilon goes to zero? We have more and more holes. Let's look on our geometry but they're located more and more dense in the space. And we hope that in the limit, probably this u epsilon will be close to the solution of, an already, of some epsilon independent problem in the unperturbed domain omega. So this is what we hope, and this is indeed true. And this is actually a known result, which I now uh, uh, would like to report in order to proceed further. So. The, um, before to proceed to this known result, let me say that the result depends essentially on two uh, uh, two numbers, p and q, which are the limits uh, of the following quantities, uh, p epsilon and q epsilon. So first of all, uh, so the result will be formulated on this, the assumption that this limits exists, uh, no matter finite or infinite, infinite limits are also allowed. The, uh, so the only assumption that the limits exist, if not, we can always uh, restrict ourselves to some convergence subsequences. So to 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 to, to consider a set of problem a sequence of problems for which these limits exist, and actually, uh, it uh, the form of the limiting problem will depend essentially on either these limits are finite, zero, or infinite. You will see this later on. So let me just recall here that d is the radio of the ball, gamma is the coupling constant and the Robin condition. And in case of Dirichlet conditions, when we have all the, for any epsilon, we have gamma is infinity. We don't care about p epsilon. We, we only consider the second limit, uh, with second quantity q epsilon, the second limit q. Okay, so, now the results are the following. So the first one is um, about the Dirichlet problem, which was obtained in the uh, 60s. It was obtained by Martin Kronkhruslov and later on proved uh, using quite different methods and actually independently by uh, Cyrilescu Mura. I think this paper by Martin Kronkhruslov actually was unknown for a long time uh, for the broad community, let's say for Western community. So. The result is the following, that if, uh, so, okay, so we are in the Dirichlet case, which means that gamma is infinity for any epsilon. In this case, u epsilon converged to the function u0. The function u0 is defined on omega, but of course the difference is evaluated only on the common part, so in L2 omega epsilon. And there is two possibilities. Either this u0 is zero over the whole omega, so which means that the solution is close to zero for small epsilon or, and this happens when Q is finite, 
U epsilon solve the following problem in the unperturbed domain omega. So as you see, in the limiting equation, you have an additional term, additional potential Q. And actually this uh, term, Chernesco and Mura, they call it strange term. And uh, since that, in the papers dealing with such kind of problems, the authors like to use this uh, kind of, uh, this name, a uh, strange term. Okay, let's look back a little bit. Uh, what does it mean that this limit Q is finite? What does it mean uh, for the size of the holes? For instance, in the three-dimensional case, it means that the holes should be of order epsilon cube. Uh, in the two-dimensional case, that means that they should be exponentially small. And actually, one can notice that the quantity which stay here, namely, uh, the surface of the unit sphere times n minus two and times d epsilon to the power n minus two. This is nothing but the harmonic capacity of the whole. So in other words, when, when the harmonic capacity is of order of the whole, of a single whole is of order epsilon in the power n and epsilon in the power n actually is the volume of the period cell. So if the capacity of the whole is of the same order as uh, the volume of the period cell, then in the limit you get uh, this potential, this potential arise in the limiting equation. Okay, now let's go to a uh, robin case. In this case, two parameters p and q plays the role. And the first result here was obtained by Kaiser in 1985. He considered some particular case when gamma, okay, so now gamma is finite, and he considered the case when gamma is finite, it's epsilon independent. So Robin conditions has coupling constant, which is epsilon independent. This case was considered by Kaizu. All other cases were then completely uh, studied by uh, Alan Brillard in 1988, and independently again by Kaizu using another methods in 1989. And surprisingly, the results basically is the same. So the same two possibilities you have that u epsilon converge to some function u0, and this function u0 is either zero, in, so zero function on omega. This happens if both limits are infinite. While if at least one of these limits is finite, then you have, uh, then u0 uh, is the solution to the following problem on omega. And again, you see that we have an additional potential, I call it v here. And this phi will be zero uh, if either of the, one of this p or q is zero. Otherwise, uh, this potential is non-zero and you have three possibilities for it, p, q, or uh, this more complicated quantity. So to be uh, like, to, to maybe to, to describe the theorem, uh, to shed some light on this result, let me consider some particular case. So I will stick to dimension n larger than three, equal larger or equal than three, because you remember in two dimensional case, there was some special definition of Q through logarithms. And I will take uh, d epsilon, the size of the radius of my holes is epsilon in the power s, s uh, larger than one, y larger than one, because you remember d epsilon should be o small of epsilon. This was our initial assumption. So s should be then small, larger than one. And gamma and the coupling constant in the Rombin conditions uh, should be epsilon in the power t uh, will be epsilon the power t, so we choose t is real. And then you have the following uh, the following picture. So here I draw the plane of parameters t and s, uh, s again larger than one, so we are left from, uh, right from this line here. And what do we have? So three possibilities. So in this pink domain, in this pink part, uh, you have p and q infinite, which means the solution goes to zero. So it will happen when either this 
uh, the holes are large enough, so we are somehow left from this, uh, so uh, from this red line or this um, uh, blue line. Or if uh, the uh, cup and also the coupling constant gamma uh, should be um, uh, should should be large enough so that we are then we will be here. Okay, uh, if uh, uh, if we are in this area, then p and uh, either p or q is zero, and which means that the potential and the limit is zero, which means that the homogenized equation is the same as the equation that we homogenize as the pre oh, pardon, a pre limit equation. And the most interesting situation is on this red line and on this blue uh, line where we have a potential and also in this point uh, on the intersection here, we have some non-zero potential. Okay, now the result which was just formulated, this known result, we can reformulate them in the operator terms, namely we can formulate them in, in terms of a kind of strong resolving convergence. Why kind of? Because of course, since our spaces are epsilon independent, we cannot say that we cannot formulate it as a usual um, strong resolving convergence. We need some kind of a natural uh, modification of the definition and this natural modification is the following. So our operators are A epsilon is our initial operator, it's a Laplacian with uh, Dirichlet conditions of the external boundary and roving conditions on the holes. Uh, A is the limiting operator, so it's uh, a Schrodinger operator with Dirichlet conditions on the boundary. And we also, to, to compare their resolvents, we need to introduce operator J epsilon from the unperturbed domain to the domain with holes. And this is just an operator of restriction to the smaller domain. And then the result which that was formulated just above uh, looks as follows. So in the first case, we take any function f restricted to the domain with holes, take the resolvent, and this will be the solution to our problem, u epsilon, it goes to zero. Uh, otherwise, we take the difference between the resolvents, but we just have to intertwine with them with this g epsilon, yeah? So, and then, then this difference uh, makes sense. So this is a reformulation of the above results just in more abstract terms, but this reformulation leads to the natural question, which will be the main goal of the talk. Uh, the goals are the following. So first of all, can we upgrade the above result to norm resolving convergence, which means the convergence which is uniform with respect to the right-hand side f from say unit ball in it too. Uh, second, can we estimate somehow the rate of this convergence, which is people call it operator estimates. Uh, I'm not sure about actually if this terminology is very correct, but at least the community homogenization like to use this, call it operator estimates. And third one, okay, since we have a non-resolving convergence, it's, uh, it's worth to ask about the convergence of spectra. Can we gain uh, from it? it it's, it's actually not a very automatic uh, question. One needs some extra work because uh, the space is epsilon independent, so we cannot use the classical result that norm resolving convergence imply the convergence of spectra. So this will be our goals that we pose in our problem in our papers. But first, uh, let me say what was done before. So there is apparently only one paper on this topic by uh, Chirinichenko, uh, uh, Dondel, and uh, Frank Rosler, who is here. Uh, where they, 2018, where they get uh, no resolving convergence for three cases. Dirichlet holes when in the scenario when Q is positive, which is the most interesting one when you have this potential. Robin holes with epsilon independent coupling constant. And when P is positive, this is, uh, Again, when you have uh, a potential, a potential with this P. Um, uh, and also Neumann holes, uh, Neumann holes 
provided the again the the size of the horses or small of epsilon, but they get no operator estimates. And in our paper with Olaf in 2018, actually we have published both in the same uh, in the same issue of asymptotic analysis. We have proven uh, we have uh, established operator estimates for Dirichlet holes. And in our recent uh, recent work with uh, Mikhail, uh, we get operator estimates for Robin holes uh, for all possible cases. And actually, as I said, I will talk mostly about uh, this one, this result, uh, but I mentioned a little bit about this uh, first one, if I will have time. So, so I will talk about Robin holes. Uh, and before to proceed, I would like to mention some other closely related papers. So first of all, there was a paper, a recent paper by Kuleane and uh, Olaf, uh, published in the beginning of the year in the journal Spectral Theory. Uh, they prove operator estimates for the Dirichlet holes in the remaining case, uh, Q uh, equals to infinity, which was not considered here, and for Neumann, small Neumann holes. And actually they did it in quite general setting on the Riemannian manifolds. So they, Omega was not the domain, but uh, Riemannian manifolds, the operator is not Laplace, but Laplace Beltrami operator. And so it was done in quite generality. Okay. There is also another paper uh, situation possible when the holes are located not over the whole uh, volume, but only along some hyperplane, or uh, in case of two-dimensional case, it's hyperplane is just a line or curve, and the holes are located only along this uh, hyperplane or, or, or curve. In this case, okay, you can study the same problem. And basically the results are up to some changes. They are the same. I mean, the limit operator is again, minus Laplacian plus potential, but now this potential will see it uh, supported by this uh, hyperplane. Yeah, so it will be delta function on the hyperplane times some constant, uh, constant in case of periodic distributions of holes. And uh, those who deal with this delta potential know, which means it means the following, that on this hammer you simply has some, uh, some special um, interface conditions. So, Concerning, I will not talk about the results, uh, like uh, the first result for this problem, I mean, strong resolving convergence, I will talk about no results for what was no, what is known in the norm resolving case. So here's the result by Gomez, Perez, and Shapashnikov 2013. Uh, they studied uh, Robin holes, but they strict, restricted to the situation when the dimension is three, and the domain omega is compact. And this was extremely important in their analysis because like some technique was based on some estimates uh, uh, from the Sobolev space theory and some embedding theorem which fails uh, for other cases. Another paper the same year by Varisov, Cardona and Durante uh, two-dimensional case was considered, uh, and there was actually a combination. There was a holes of two kinds, Dirichlet and Robin. On the Dirichlet, there was all scenario, and for Robin holes, only epsilon independent coupling constant. Uh, and there is a very recent paper, like in September, I think, by Borisov and, uh, oh my God, uh, Muhammad Muhammad Rahimova, 2021. They consider multi-dimensional case, so any dimensions, and they consider the case of Dirichlet holes, uh, but large. Large means that this V is, so to say, infinity, which means that on this gamma you simply have Dirichlet conditions from both sides, and also. There are also nonlinear Robin conditions, which doesn't spoil the, the results. So the result was like uh, result, the form of the limiting equation was due to the Dirichlet holes and long linear conditions just make the life more complicated, but doesn't ch lead to change of the limiting uh, homogenized, homogenized problem. 
And the condition that they consider was even uh, non-linear. So in this case, you cannot say, of course, no resolving convergence because uh, there's no linear operators, but okay, you can say about the convergence of the solutions to the corresponding problems, which is uniform with respect to the corresponding right-hand side. Okay, and the other, the last bench of results, which I like to mention before to proceed to our results, it's what happened in the case of large holes. When the size of the holes is the same radius as the period, here's I know two results. Uh, the first one by Zhikov Postochova and then by another methods by Suslina, where they, in both they were proved uh, the norm resolving convergence for the Neumann Laplacian, so Neumann holes. Uh, in this case, actually, it's worth to say that the limiting operator is now different. In this case, when the holes are the same uh, size as the period, you have the operator A, it's not Laplacian, but some uh, elliptic operator with a constant, uh, the, with some matrix here, which is a constant matrix, in case of periodic distribution of holes, which was actually in Zhikov, Postucho, and Suslino works. Uh, but this matrix, uh, and this matrix to find its coefficient, you have to, um, to solve some, some problem on the period cell. This is the well-known things for those dealing with periodic homogenization. Uh, as a, and the, the last paper which I'd like to mention is by Frank, a uh, recent paper in Siam, uh, where he studied uh, the domain which, so in our situation, omega was epsilon independent. So we take epsilon independent domain omega, and then perforate it. He studied the situation when omega is also dependent on epsilon, namely it's a, a zine domain. So it shrinks, when epsilon goes to zero, it shrinks to the interval. So in this case, the limiting operator leaves uh, on the line actually. And uh, um, it's ordi ordinary differential operator. And there was also some extensions to perforated graph lag domains. I will not talk about this here. Okay, so this was the introduction to the topic. Now let me proceed to our results. So I recall you that the goal is for the problem which was formulated on the first slide to, to prove the, the kind of operator, uh, prove the operator convergence, non-resolving convergence and uh, to get some estimates on the rate of this convergence. And this is immediately, a, I will formulate the main result that we get. And the result is the following that. Let P and Q, either P or Q is finite. Uh, I recall that in this case, the solution to our problem converged to U zero, which is the solution of the homogenized problem uh, involving additional potential V extra potential V and this V is the limit of V epsilon. And this, this difference uh, is estimated by the L2 norm of the right-hand side times some constant and times some del the delta epsilon, which is defined here. This gamma epsilon, large gamma epsilon uh, is simply the ratio D epsilon over epsilon. I recall you that this goes to zero. This was our, initial uh, assumption. And let me say that basically for the Dirichlet holes, uh, we get the result together with Olaf and the result was the same. In, in, in this case, we're not interested in P, P is always infinity, so only Q, but the error term was up to some, like some small details was the same, the same. Okay, so this is our result. As you see, the speed of convergence we get depends essentially on the dimension. Now what happened in the case when both P and Q are uh, infinite? Well, sorry, can I ask something quickly? Yeah. Uh, what are your hypotheses on the domain? Uh, which one? Uh, omega. Oh, omega. So hypotheses are the following. Uh, in case when omega is uh, compact, uh, then we have, um, so basically conditions uh, are the following. Uh, we need to guarantee that the solution to our problem is in, uh, in H2. 
uh, omega, mm -hmm. which means that C2, for instance, or it could be con uh, convex Lipschitz. Uh, yeah. If it is unbounded, then you have two things. Uh, you need some smoothness on the boundary, let's say C2. And also you need the condition, uh, which we called, um, if I remember, a uniform irregularity of the boundary, which, which basically means that, oh, okay, if you have something like a waveguide, uh, then uh, the, the boundary of this waveguide should not oscillate too much uh, at the infinity. Mm -hmm. So the curvature uh, of this domain should be uh, bounded. So this is uh, the uh, assumption. Under this assumption uh, of this uniform regularity, again, the solution will be in H2 uh, on this domain. Okay, but the domain can have any shape. In any, shape any shape. Okay, thank you. Tak. Good, let's go. So now what happened if both are infinite? Uh, in this case, recall solution goes to zero and here's the estimate, and here's the estimate. And I would like actually to uh, show very quickly the idea of the proof in this case. So the idea is the following. It's you consider the period cell, one period cell, you remove from this period cell, we have a hole in it and the re rest part, we, I call it Y I epsilon, yeah? Y I epsilon. So now one can prove, and this is the crucial part of the proof, the following estimate that the L2 norm of any function U oh, from H1, okay, on this uh, period cell, this gray part, is estimated through the gradient of U over the same part plus the L2 norm of, and the L2 norm of U uh, the trace of u over the boundary of the hole with some constant. And this constant, they of course depends on epsilon, but what's important, this constant one over q epsilon, one over p epsilon. Here we have this gamma epsilon from the coupling, uh, from the Robin conditions and some constant here, which is epsilon independent. Yeah, so we have how to prove it. Those ideas like you take a point uh, inside this domain, you take a point uh, on the boundary, you write a fundamental theorem of calculus along the line which connect them and doing some kind of Cauchy-Schwarz, such kind of things, you, you arrive basically on this. Uh, it's very easy to do in one dimensional situation, but in multi-dimensional case, you should simply to find the way how to clever integrate this stuff. Now, uh, this, the last one, uh, the last estimate is the estimate for this, uh, say, boundary layer where we have uh, no holes. This boundary layer is uh, of the uh, thickness epsilon. Uh, and then you have the following estimate, epsilon square, because you have a Dirichlet conditions on the boundary. If you would have Neumann, then we'll, there will be epsilon, but since you have Dirichlet, then you have epsilon square. Okay, now you sum up everything. Then you get an integral over omega epsilon. Here I take the largest of this constants, so p, one over p, one over q and gamma. And here I sum up. And it's easy to see that what's written here, just the form that uh, generate our operator. So you can write like that. Uh, this term is actually a negative, so you can remove forget about it, so then it will be not equality, but inequality. And this is basically for the, this, that's all. For this term, you use Cauchy-Schwarz and divide both sides by the norm of u epsilon, and you will get your result. Okay, but the main, main ingredient is here, of course, it's here. Okay, now let me proceed to the next result. Next result. The question is the following. Okay, we estimated the difference in the L2 norm. What we can say about the difference in the H1 norm? Will, will it be close, the U epsilon and U0 in the H1? And the answer is yes, they will be close uh, in some cases, not in all of them, but nevertheless, in all cases, you have this estimate. You have this estimate, but this constant in the right hand side goes to zero uh, 
only if one of the three conditions holds. Here it's written y actually, with some simple estimates, but actually if one of this, one, this, this, or this condition holds, uh, then uh, we, goes to, we go to, uh, this right-hand side goes to zero. Uh, delta is the uh, error from the first theorem. So, so these three cases cover everything except this situation. So this situation treats, needs an additional treatment. But before to proceed to the result, let me show what these three cases mean, where they are. So for this, I have to come back to my, oh, sorry, to my picture um, uh, with uh, the example. Oh, yeah, here. So, so where the solutions will be close in uh, H1, they will be close in the yellow domain where, uh, um, where the potential is zero. They will be close in this uh, red uh, line, but they will not be close here on the blue one and at this point. And in this point and the, the blue one, we to get some reasonable result, we need a corrector. We need a special corrector. Okay, now let me come back. Strength of validation doesn't work. Let me come back to the results. So, uh, in, yeah. Here's the result. Okay, now what to do in this special case? This special case, as I say, corresponds to this that special point where P and Q are both positive and also when Q is positive, but uh, uh, P is uh, inf uh, infinite. Uh, wait, uh, wait a second. Uh, yeah, when, uh, yeah, and P is infinity, and P is infinity. So in this case, you need a special corrector. You need a special corrector. And this corrector is here. This is the operator of multiplication by the function g epsilon. And this function g epsilon has the following form. So this is the mm, sum of, so each of this term is localized in the period cell due to some special cutoff function, I, 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 phi. This phi is needed to, to localize the terms. Uh, here, what stay here, it's the function which is harmonic and which, uh, uh, which is equal to one, uh, yeah, to the one, uh, yeah, to one, uh, no, no, wait a second. Yeah, it's a harmonic function of the following form. It's a harmonic function of the following form. And, this function looks as follows. This, uh, uh, if you look at this, this stuff, one can prove actually that far enough from the holes, this function is very small. Like uh, it, 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 its impact to the L2 norm of this difference is negligible. But this function has a very large gradient near the holes. And that's why it makes some non-trivial contribution. So it's really needed to have a reasonable result to estimate the difference between u epsilon and u. So you need this corrector here. Okay. Now, as I say, we have a, this norm resolving convergence. What about convergence of spectra? So yeah, we have a convergence of spectra too. And the result sounds as follows. So first of all, how we will measure the distance between the spectra. We don't know actually if omega is bounded or unbounded. That's why the spectra may be not necessarily discrete, purely discrete. That's why it's reasonable to measure the Hausdorff distance between the spectra. Here's a definition of the Hausdorff matrix, a standard definition. I uh, recall actually what does it mean that the Hausdorff distance between the two sets, two compact sets uh, two closed sets is some number, some number delta say, uh, it, it's the following. You take uh, the such number delta, which such that X belongs to the delta neighborhood of Y, and Y belongs to the delta neighborhood of X. And then you take the smallest of such delta uh, deltas and that this will be your Hausdorff matrix, but it's actually 
more precisely the definition is written here. But the problem that this notion is quite, quite restrictive for our purposes because one knows that if we have a convergence of in norm uh, uh, and you want to show, okay, and you want to show that you have a convergence in this matrix of spectra, but the closeness of spectra in this matrix means that the they should be close in, in all, on all energies in all parts of the uh, positive real line, which is actually not guaranteed, uh, usually by non-resolving convergence. Non-resolving convergence guarantees that the spectra are close, uh, let's say on the finite part uh, of the line, yeah? So you take a finite part of the line and instead of this finite part, you have a convergence. That's why to overcome this, we introduce the weighted uh, metric or the, so we will measure the distance, be, not between the spectra, but between the resolvents, yeah? So we take, uh, we introduce such a metric and one can see that if I have two negative operators and with the spectra X and Y, then what's written here is that how's the distance between the spectra of the resolvents. And then with respect to this matrix, two spe spectra can be close even if they differ uh, significantly on the high energies. Okay, now, uh, uh, the last remark concerning this definition. Okay, I have two sets, X epsilon, the sequence of sets and set X. And I say that uh, X epsilon converge to X according in this weighted matrix. What does it mean? It means that this condition is equivalent to the uh, fulfillment simultaneous of the following two, uh, two uh, properties, namely, uh, the first one, if I have a point X uh, from the limiting set, then there is a family X epsilon from the set X epsilon converge, which converge to X, this first. And second, if I take uh, X from the complement of this set, then there is exist a Delta neighborhood of this uh, set uh, of this point X uh, such that this Delta neighborhood has no points uh, of the set X epsilon for small enough epsilon. Good. Then, uh, okay, now this is our result that the Hausdorff distance between the spectra of A epsilon, our operator the limit one and the limiting one is estimated by C delta epsilon. C is the epsilon independent constant and delta epsilon is the same error which was on the first theorem. Okay, uh, now I would like to ask, uh, uh, our organizer, uh, what about time? How much time I have? Uh, I see, can I speak maybe 10, 10, 10 or more minutes? Yeah, 10 minutes will be perfectly fine, sure. Yeah, okay. Now, at this point, I would like to say um, something about the ideas for the proof. So the proof of this results is based on a, uh, on the abstract scheme, which was developed by Olaf Post, and which serves to prove the convergence of, for instance, in spect of spectra or the resolvents in the situation when the space is uh, parameter dependent. So there is a lot of facts, but I will present only two facts which are needed for our purposes. So. Assume I have two Hilbert spaces, H epsilon and H. What's important that here, epsilon, H epsilon stands only for, it's only the notation for some other Hilbert space that differs from H, no, in general differs. Maybe they are the same, but it's more interesting when they are different, but it does not mean that it depends somehow on epsilon. So far in this part of the talk is just two Hilbert spaces, which in general could be different. Now in this spaces, we consider two non-negative and self-adjoint operators. I call them A epsilon and A, and by small A epsilon and A, I, or better say gothic A epsilon A, I didn't know they associated sesquilinear forms, the forms associated with these operators. So together with H epsilon H, I will introduce what's called the energy norms. So these are, uh, I will take the Hilbert spaces functions uh, from uh, the form domains and the norm is the standard energy norm is the standard energy norm and the spaces I will call them h1 epsilon and h1 
this is quite natural notation because when we deal with Laplace, with Laplace type operators, then these spaces are nothing but some Sobolev's H1 type spaces. And I need one more space uh, uh, only for, for H. Um, it's the space I call it H2. It's a Hilbert space consisting of five. So now it will be the four, not form domain, but operator domain. And the norm I will introduce like that. It's kind of a graph norm. Actually, it's not the graph norm. Uh, I, I should write the norm of AF plus the norm of F, but um, this then it will be the graph norm. But uh, the operator is non-negative and uh, this norm is equivalent. So I, like, I like to write, write in this way. And this notation also makes sense because if we deal with the uh, Laplacian, and uh, for instance, Dirichlet Laplacian uh, or Schrodinger operator uh, on the domain having some regularity, then we know that uh, the form domain, uh, the functions from the form domains uh, belongs to Sobolev space H2. That's why I choose this notation. And actually this norm is equivalent to the H2 norm. This is what is called elliptic regularity, standard elliptic regularity. Okay, uh, now uh, among all the results which Olaf developed, uh, I choose this one, which we basically plays the main role in our paper, which is, I will take from this paper by recent paper by Olaf and Kuliane. And the result is the following. So, so I have two operate, four operators. Uh, the first two are in between spaces. So from H to H epsilon and back. And this is between the form domains from H1 to H1 epsilon and back. A linear operators defined on the whole. So this one on the whole H or this one on the whole H epsilon and so on. And we assume that this operator satisfied some conditions, uh, namely, so the first condition uh, is uh, the following. It says that the forms A epsilon and A are closed in a certain sense. Uh, I mean, the difference between these forms is estimated by some delta, which is supposed to be small in applications, times the graph norm of AF times the energy norm of U. Uh, let me comment a little bit on this condition. This is a uh, known results. You can find them, for instance, in the Cato bo Cato's book or in the Leiden Simon, that if you have a closeness with some natural sense of the force generating operators, then you have a non-resolving convergence, norm the close of closeness of operators in the non-resolving matrix. In our case, we have an operator acting in different spaces, so we cannot compare the forms in the usual sense, but we need to use some operators between the form domains and this operator stand here. You see then in this case, this what's written here makes sense. I do not write that this should hold for any F and U for which what's written here makes sense. So for any F from the domain of the operator for any U from the form domain. Okay, so assume that this condition holds, but we need, of course, some other conditions to guarantee the uh, conditions on these operators uh, to guarantee the closeness of the resolvents. And these conditions are here. So the, uh, the last one means that the operator G epsilon and G epsilon with tilde are almost adjoined to each other. Yeah, so if delta would be zero, then this means that G epsilon, G epsilon tilde are mutual adjoined to each other. Uh, but delta is not zero, so they're kind of, I can say, I, simp I don't know, say almost adjoined to each other. And these two conditions mean that if I take my G epsilon one and take a restriction to, uh, no, pardon, uh, if, uh, no, no, if, uh, pardon. Uh, yeah, if I take G epsilon, which is defined on the whole space H and take the restriction to the form domain, then it, it will be, uh, I will get almost the operator G epsilon one. So the difference will be small. 
the same here for the other pair of operators. So if this conditions holds, then the difference between the operators, uh, between the uh, resolvents intertwined with the G epsilon here in G epsilon one here is small, is estimated by four delta epsilon, delta is this one, times the norm of F in the Hilbert space. So here you have energy norm, energy norm, in particular, since energy norm is dominates over the sp space norm, that means that we have a difference also in this, in the Hilbert space. It means that this difference in the Hilbert space H epsilon is small. And actually, when we take this difference in the Hilbert space, we can somehow remove this one. Uh, it, it will not change too much the stuff and due to this conditions basic condition basically. And then we have a, what we have in our first result. And, to, and from this estimate, we also have our H1 estimates. This is the H1 norm kind of. And then you have to look closely what's this G epsilon one means. In some cases, this G epsilon one will produce you that corrector that we have. Okay, but maybe I have not so much time to go to so much to the details. Another abstract result is used for convergence of spectra. And we, estimate, uh, we get it together with Olaf in our recent paper in Journal of Physics A. So uh, if you have two operators now only between the spaces, So this one small is, is estimated by delta and delta epsilon if you intertwine it in another way. So he intertwined it with G epsilon and here we put G epsilon tilde from the other side. Both of them should be small. And actually, and there is also two conditions on the operator G epsilon, G epsilon tilde. In applications, usually these deltas are small, this nu are small and the mu are close to one. If you, write, if you try to do it for some simple applications, you will get that this is close to one, these guys are small and this one's are small. So if this condition is hold, then the Hausdorff, okay, weighted Hausdorff distance between the, the spectra is estimated by this quantity. And it's easy to see that this goes to zero if this new epsilon and, or if this red constants, if they goes to zero and the constants mu are, at least bounded. Uh, I'm sorry, is a misprint. Of course, here should be in the epsilon with tilde. Okay, but important thing that this and the previous theorem, I, I recall that the parameter epsilon plays no role. There's no parameter epsilon basically. Here's just two Hilbert spaces, H and H epsilon. The parameter, the epsilon serves solely to distinguish somehow it from H. Okay, and the last uh, slide, how this scheme is realized, how we realized it with Michael Kuhn for the Robin problem. So these are our Hilbert space H epsilon, it's just L2, here's our form. Here's our space H is L2 on omega, here's our limiting form. The operator G epsilon we have already, it's operator for restriction. The operator G epsilon is still this convenient natural to take operator of extension by zero. In this case, uh, these two operators are joined to each other and which means that one of the conditions of our abstract theorem is automatically fulfills. Now, what about these two operators between the form domains? So the most simple one is the operator from the form domain, uh, the perforated space, it's H1 to H1 on uh, the whole space. And here we use, um, uh, the, the, this is the known uh, uh, sink in the homogenization. If you have a function for H1 on the perforated domain, you always can extend it to H1 function to the whole domain in such a way that the extension operator will be silent independent. And the only condition you need for this, that your holes should not be close enough to each other. That the fact that they're small, it's not a problem. The problem uh, may, will appear if they're close to each other. But if they're on some no good distance, then everything is fine. You can make such an extension. While for the operator from H1 to H1 epsilon, this is operator back from the perf H1 on the omega to H1 on omega epsilon. Principally, we you can simply take a restriction, but this condition, this it's just too simple choice. It doesn't work properly. Uh, 
more clever choices here. And basically the idea is to modify the function near the boundary of the hole in such a way that this function g epsilon one f will satisfy the corresponding Robin conditions uh, on the boundary of the hole. And here's some modification, which is not maybe very simple, but so I won't comment on it so much, but this is basically the idea of modifying near the holes in such a way that the boundary conditions are fulfilled. So that's all and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So So thank you for the very nice talk. So do, do we have questions for the speaker? Uh, Dave. Hi, hi. Um, Andre, a very, very interesting talk. Um, we, we had a question from Frank about the, um, the, the regularity of omega. Uh, I wondered, could you comment on, on the regularity assumption on the inclusions? I mean, you, you assume that they were just balls, right? Um, yeah. but, but will, uh, I mean, do the L2 results carry over to, to non-smooth inclusions or? So, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, concerning the uh, regularity of inclusion, I think like 99 and 9%, I'm sure, despite we did our results for uh, balls, but the reasons was not about the regularity, but it, because of something else, because for the balls, you can compute some quantities uh, exactly. But nevertheless, for uh, any for balls or, or for holes of arbitrary shape, uh, qualitatively the result will be the same. And I think I'm pretty sure that the uh, regularity plays no role here. In particular, you can take the whole. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think regularity plays no role here. Um, the, ah, the the only thing which it will uh, wait, it will play the role when you will make an extension. Yeah, because one of this operator, it was an extension inside the holes. So yeah, maybe here it will it will play the role. So you will need some uh, regularity for that. Uh, I don't remember right now precisely what kind of regularity you need to get it. So this is the point where you need it. So, yeah. so, sorry, Andre. Can I make a comment yeah. about this question? So I, I, I thought that you, apart from the extension, uh, I'm not sure how you use it, but um, I, I would think about the behavior of your capacitary, solution of your capacitary problem away from, from that uh, shape. So it, it needs to be of the same order as say for the balls. So it needs to decay ex uh, exponentially, exactly. right? In in n greater than or equal exactly. to three. And exactly. Apparent, I, I, well, it depends of on probably whether such capacitive problem has this decay. So if if not, then. But uh, but for Dirichlet problem, this decay is. An, I think it's a known fact. Uh, I think, and uh, I, I think uh, the regularity is not needed. So if you have, uh, for instance, if you have. Uh, uh, your domain is, for instance, in the Dirichlet case. Yeah, I, I was talking about the Robin one, but let's simplify the life. Let's we have Dirichlet holes. In this case, you will need at some point you will need to find uh, the capacity of your hole, and to but you don't need in this case to ex to make this extension. That this this step is not needed. Yeah, Dirichlet. but for, for Dirichlet it's always easy. But then if you take Robin problem and yeah, some kind of cusp, not, then there might be a problem. Uh, my, maybe, maybe if you if you have a cusp i i would i wouldn't i wouldn't be so sure that uh you mean cusp uh, which means that you have uh, non lip uh, non lipschitz but lipschitz probably is still fine but well you need you need some known results for this right so maybe yes maybe yes but but I don't know. I, I really don't know because, as I said, we did everything uh, for the balls where you can compute mm -hmm. everything. That's why I don't know. Uh, I maybe I will be silent because intuitively I think this decay will be the same uh, because we, we we don't care what's going on 
in the vicinity of the walls, but rather what's going on, how it behaves far away from infinity, this is important. But I don't know, maybe maybe the horns will, oh, pardon, yeah, horns or uh, will change somehow the life. I don't know. Okay, thanks, Andre. Further questions? Uh, yeah, I, I had another question. So probably you can formulate this uh, mod instead of weighted or modified house of distance. You essentially you estimate the distance between spectra of the resolvents. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, you could uh, introduce into your estimate on the right hand side, uh, I guess, uh, uh, or on the left hand side, multiply by the uh, by lambda something like this ah uh, or divide but no no if if you take this so so if you restrict your attention yeah, yeah, I, to, I understand so 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 your is estimate uh, maybe i can say like that so uh, to take uh, to restrict uh, to restrict uh, the spectra to some interval say from 0 to some l uh, then measure the Hausdorff distance between the spectra inside the zero L, but then uh, in the right hand side of the estimate will the length of the interval will enter somehow. Yeah, yeah. it's probably L, L and whatever small parameter you had in the convergence. Uh, yeah, maybe I think you can do this, but simply this was which. Yeah, OK, yeah, yeah, it's just a... I think I think it uh, definitely you will have a convergence. Uh, what about uh, for any like finite interval? Uh, but what about estimates? I think the same te uh, technique can be used. Some abstract result can be obtained, but we simply didn't do that. So yeah, yeah, I believe yes. I would say like that. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you. Are there any more questions for Andre? Uh, maybe a quick one. So could you go back, I don't know, two or three slides where the conditions were on the bilinear forms? Uh, yeah, this one where you have the H2 norm of F. Mm -hmm. That's why you need H2 regularity of solutions. Is that right? Exactly. Uh, at some point you estimate uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's the point. That's the point. You uh, you estimate uh, the difference between the norms uh, between the forms. At some point, you estimate estimate. At some point, you will have H two norm of F by H two. I mean Sobolev norm H two, mm. and then you have to estimate the Sobolev norm by the norm in this curved H, which is not not always the same if omega has. Um, is not regular enough. So, so this is you're right. This is the place where we need it. Um, so this is an F lives on omega. So it's only the regularity of omega that that's important. And for you, you can take the H one norm. So exactly. regularity of the holes is less important. Exactly. Exactly. Is it is it the same in, in so so there is a paper by Anne and Post and then by you and Post right on on this. Uh, kind of uh, uh, norm resolving estimates, right? right. Uh, actually, uh, original, maybe I should cite it, but uh, the original like scheme was introduced by Olaf uh, quite in 2006. I think there was a paper in uh, uh, an analysis, Henri Poincaré, uh, where the difference, so, and the result there was the difference between the resolvents in the uh, in the Hilbert space, not in the energy. So this is better result. Yeah, here ah, you have yeah. different. You see, here is a good thing. You have a difference in the energy norm. Mm -hmm. uh, the price you pay is instead of G epsilon, you have G epsilon one. And this is an operator which leads to probably not always the, to some correctors. Mm -hmm. there. Yeah, and the second result about spectral convergence, yeah, it's a paper with Olaf in Journal of Physics. Hey, uh, it was published just months ago or something. Uh, 
uh, this one. Mm -hmm. And and here you didn't need the uh, H two norm, or did you? Here. Here. Here not. Here, uh, yeah, but here you see on this two condi first two conditions. So imagine mm -hmm. that you already estimate somehow. Mm -hmm. You don't know by some magic the difference between the results. But of course, it's not enough to get information about the spectra. Ah, yeah, it's okay. Be yeah. Because this condition holds simply for if you take G epsilon equal to zero. Yeah, and this one also. Yeah, this condition always holds. No matter no matter how the operators a epsilon and a looks like. That's why you need some extra conditions on the operators a epsilon, g epsilon tilde. And these extra conditions are here. Mm -hmm. And actually, I would like to comment on them. If you look on these conditions, so uh, the, the Olaf originally invented his abstract results for graph-like domains. So the, the domains that, uh, or manifolds, that shrinks to a graph. And you have Laplace type operators on them. And in this case, H is the operator on the line and H epsilon is the operator, uh, H epsilon is the L2 norm on this tubular domains. And what's written here, it's uh, something like, uh, no, I don't know which one of them, I think, uh, yeah, I think this one, the second one, is something like uh, abstract Poincaré inequality. Uh, when, when we have operator on the graph, on the natural choice for this G, it's what? You just take uh, average over the cross section and scale it appropriately. So then this inequality say that the L2 norm uh, of the function on this graph-like domain is estimated by the, you take average, uh, by the way, here's a misprint. Here should be H norm, of course, not H epsilon. You take an average. So now this one already one dimensional on the line. And here's the gradient, actually. And constant here is close to one or one, uh, depends on your scaling. And here is of order diameter of your domain, of your transversal uh, di diameter squared. Yeah, so this is what's written here is kind of something like a Poincaré inequality. Mm -hmm. but well, I this is kind of L2 equivalence between uh, spaces H and H epsilon. Kind of, because I don't have here the uh, estimate for, yeah, you're right, actually, you, kind of, yeah. Okay, thank you. Right, so if there are no Further questions? Doesn't look like that's the case. So let's thank the speaker again for the nice talk and for Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, once again for your.